What's up guys and gals, welcome back to the Nerdcast. Today in the world of indie games, we're checking out a little game called Vagrus. Which I think is a game where you are like a vagrant. We have a traveling company, we do some strategic stuff. Oh, here's a fun fact. I'm in this game. Oh yes! Game's not even out yet. I'm already in it. Seen pictures of myself in it. Their artist added me to the game. Apparently I'm some kind of... I look like Darth Maul, alright? I've got horns coming out of the side of my head. I definitely don't look like a good guy, but I don't know when I'm gonna come up in the story. I don't know if I'm gonna be like a playable character, or if I'm just some guy that looks like Darth Maul messing with you the whole time. But if you ever wanted to imagine me as like a Sith Lord, this game might be the game for you. I'm just saying, anytime anyone puts me in a game, I'm pretty stoked about it. I don't know, you dream of that stuff when you're like an early YouTuber, you know, with like 500 subscribers, you're like, someday, someday, you're like singing Disney songs at your back fence while looking at the moon, a mouse hops by on the fence and joins you for the high harmony, you know how it goes, that doesn't happen to you in your life, alright, well never mind then, I suppose that's just unique to me, I might be a Disney princess, and if I am, I hope I'm Jasmine, anyways, let's start the game on off and see if it's any good, huh? Comitatus, an armed traveling company. Okay. Apparently the Vagris is the commander of the Comitatus. The River Realms, they call it. What a fine poetic name for something as rotten and twisted as our land has become. It was not always so. Long ago, the old empire, the noblest and most enduring society created by humankind, spanned almost the entire continent of Zerin, the cradle of man. But after several millennia of progress and incomparable achievements, inevitably, the Empire began to fall into stagnation and decadence. Desperately holding onto their privileges and resisting change while trying to avert the collapse of the realm, the Emperor and his theocracy took to measures that were worthy of true despots in cruelty. Subjugating weaker realms, enslaving whole nations, strip mining foreign resources, oppressing imperial citizens, war on several fronts, genocide. Eventually the gods could no longer tolerate such horrors wrought in their name. Foretold by an abundance of divine omens, they descended upon the Empire to right its wrongs. Thus, in a chain of dreadful events that became known as the Calamity, they annihilated the Empire in a matter of days. The gods then finally saw what they had done in their anger and confusion. It is said that so much grief and shame filled them that they were broken and they left this reality, never to return. The continent and its inhabitants seemed dead, but at length survivors began to crawl out of their hiding holes and faced a land that no longer welcomed them. Arcane anomalies, the fallout of the calamity, now riddled the continent and people realized that they had to share their new home with changed and twisted creatures. Terrible beings entered through the cracks in the tapestry of reality and rose to rule over the natives. In time, these new powers rebuilt the fallen empire in their own image, and the river realms, now godless and vengeful, reincarnated from the ashes. The inhabitants of the land, such as I, now eke out a living under the crushing rule of the new empire. The continent itself constantly resists our every attempt at building a cozy home for ourselves. As travel is dangerous, many ventures specialize in transferring cargo and passengers over bleak and deadly leagues of land. Others try to take everything of value from said travelers, or attempt to find buried treasures among the ruins of the old empire. The leaders of the endeavors are, some say, the bravest men and women of the river realms. Such a leader is called a Vagras. Apparently I'm a Vagras. I thought I was a Vagras, but apparently I'm a Vagras. That's fine. 
Pronunciation doesn't matter. I'm in the game! Let's start a new one, shall we? I have no idea what I'm doing right now. I'm probably going to run this mercenary company into the ever-loving ground. It's probably going to be really, really, really bad. Like, if there's someone to trust in the post-apocalyptic, I, I don't think it would be me. The post-apocalypse. I don't know. The post-apocalyptic sounds like something that, like, was that what I said? I don't even know what I said anymore, but the post-apocalyptic, it, it sounds like something that people with extra arms would do. Ah, yes. A Vagrus. What a profession. Daring and savvy. Always watching the horizon. Always looking for an opportunity. And of course, for what is best for his comitatus, eh? And you are a Vagros too, are you not? Many of your kind have I seen in my long life as a vagabond. Care to listen to a story about your exquisite occupation, good master? It is a tale of woe and terror, but it is also a tale that is true, as I have seen it with mine own eyes. Yes, tell me your story, old bald man, for I wish it to be so. Wise you are, good master. My tale is of a Vagras such as yourself, but one whose fate was cursed and wrought with ill fortune. It all happened a long time ago. Ten years, maybe more. I was but a passenger, traveling rough roads and forgotten ways with this comitatus south along the feet of the great mountains of the west. Let's start it on up. Why not? I see no reason not to. This comitatus I speak of had fallen under hard times. Perhaps it was due to imperial harassment or unfortunate decisions, or simply bad luck. Ira Franz, saint of Rhodes, does not always smile on us mere mortals. But however it came to pass, their coin was drying up, and their opportunities seemed few and far between. One of the last chances their Vagras saw was to travel to the remote town of Scrap Heap and spend their remaining funds to stock up on cheap scrap metal. This metal could be sold for great profit over in the East and South. It wasn't a bad plan, truly, but it was not without risks either. Alright, let's go buy ourselves some random busted pieces of Cadillac. So apparently we are over here on the flag or something like that. Apparently, I can click on icons inside of windows or something. It's an open world game due to the Pilgrims of the Wasteland being a tutorial that possesses a narrow, guided path in the beginning and opens up later after core mechanics have been introduced. All right, sounds good. Let's do this thing. Uh, on the campaign map, we are always occupying a node and moves between all nodes along paths. Moving along paths will cost you movement points indicated next to the path. All right, so we have how many movement do we have? We have enough to get here. Let's go. Yep, clip clop your way on over there. Having gone ahead of the column with a handful of scouts, you watch from a ridge as your comitatus slowly trudges along, making its way ponderously among dormant geysers and broken terrain. All around you, the hills smolder lazily in the perpetual twilight. You alright? Javik's voice resonates with sympathy as he appears next to you on the ridge. You nod slowly, but don't look at him, your gaze lost in the distance where the ash cloaks the horizon and the towering mountains to the south and west. Turning to your comis, you note his supportive smile. You and Javik have been traveling around the realms together for years now, and there's no other person in the world who you trust more than him, except perhaps yourself. I know you feel constrained, but I still feel like I said before. You made the right choice by leading us here. Well, it has to work. We can't fail, not like this. You glance at Javik and notice the worried look he's giving you. You turn away back towards the horizon. There's no reason to be crestfallen yet. Let's just stick to the plan. Why wouldn't it work? You know, there could be hundreds of reasons, but don't feel like reminding him. The crew? It should not come as a surprise since you've known and traveled with most of them for years and years, some founding members of the Comitatus you would trust with your life, but you've heard stories before about the Vagrai, who have been abandoned for less. Times being what they are, Javik trails off. The Imperial's cracking down on us, independence more heavily than before, business is tough, everybody knows, but... They appreciate your efforts to keep us floating. Well, this ought to give us another chance. You plan. You talked about your traveling company into this, or you talked the traveling company into this a few weeks ago, but with each step towards the western mountains, more and more of them have started to have doubts, such as the way of the road. 
The plan involves a desperate attempt at squeezing a low-selling price for metal bits out of an old contact of yours in the town of Scrap Heap and stocking up on said metal by spending the rest of your coin and bringing the cargo down south along the Molten Tongue to Devon via Vernum and Ash. There's a shortage of metal in Devon, and you know several buyers who'd give a pretty price for your goods if you can only make it there, before many others with a similar cargo do. Such contacts are the boon of decades spent on the road. But even if Narbo, that villain, gave you an agreeable price in Scrap Heap, the road is not without its risks. Sneaking through the gap between the dead forest and the molten tongue is inviting disaster, and it's not a path that many Vograi would take. And of course, if this fails, you've utterly run out of alternatives. Do you think Narbo is going to help us out? That old scavenger was never famous for his goodwill. Oh, apparently I didn't notice. There's a tutorial thing over here on the left. It wanted me to click this right here. And then that's going to give us like a Torment-style guide to basically the universe. All right. Well, we need to find a way to compel him. These are dark times that call for desperate deeds. And such thoughts make me really uncomfortable, to be honest. Javik rubs his chin absentmindedly. You've seen this expression of his too often not to realize that he's using his sorcerer's talent to read your mind. Taking a peek. Apologies. Javik quickly rubs his eyes and looks away briefly. You know how it is. It comes to me so naturally that sometimes I don't even notice that I'm doing it. Your thoughts were loud, Vagris. I have to actually block them, you see. After joining your comitatus six years ago, Javik proved to be an invaluable asset. Not only does he sense moods and thoughts around him, but he's also able to subtly manipulate others when he focuses his inner energies. Comes pretty handy when doing business. And then there's this other perk. A few times he saw him shatter the minds of men and beasts who tried to kill him. Wasn't a pretty sight, but a very effective deterrence. Not because he's not a trained, and yet because he's not a trained sorcerer, at least not in the traditional sense, his abilities are sometimes difficult to control. You become accustomed to his impromptu thought scans, while others find it less bearable to be around him. For this reason, he's kept his abilities a secret for many years overall, but you can't keep a secret such as that in a close-knit community of comitatus, especially not if you keep bursting minds and knowing that you shouldn't. So there are only a handful of your comes who put up with him being around for long. Even so, he hasn't probed you in years, certainly not on purpose, but neither by accident. Perhaps he's less in control now, which suggests he's more on edge about the whole trip than he'd let it show. Apology accepted. Both of you walk to the comitatus and join the column. All right, As we were coming up to the gates of Scrap Heap, this trash pile town of cutthroats and scavengers, we could see the vast mountain ranges of shattered Bivandar Thar looming ominously over the horizon. Oop, that was an accident. I was trying to I was trying to pan the I wanted to look at the mountains he was talking about. I wanted to look at the mountains. I'm sorry, Chad. I've ruined your exposition, but I wanted to see the beautiful hand painted mountains that the developers have put in front of me. That one was my fault. Normally it's not my fault, it's a bug in the game. That one was my fault. I take full responsibility. I'm sorry. At the foot of the ever fuming mountains of the ancient dwarven kingdom lies Scrap Heap, the town of Scavengers. Debris and junk is piled into veritable hills upon which the rickety homes of decrepit inhabitants stand precariously. Ash lingers everywhere, and the sun is almost always absent from the twilight skies. Deals are struck day and night over the precious metal scraps gathered in the ruins of nearby Vendar Thar, while the Heap King oversees all from his dreaded tower. Shady eyes and soot-covered faces watch from under ash-laden awnings, and life is cheaper than iron. Okay, let's track down Narbo. You make your way to the Wraith Stash, a notorious watering hole tucked away in a small street just behind the imposing tower of the Heap King, but not quite under its immense shadow. Not many frequent the establishment, which makes it perfect for Narbo and his little operation of honest merchants. Apparently, the knave is not only alive, but has done well for himself in the past decade or so. Taking only Javik, you leave the Comitatus to take care of Titus, your quartermaster, while you're done negotiating. Ash is flitting from the black sky as you cross the street and nod to the bouncer, the Wraith Stash. You give him your sidearms quietly, rules are rules, at least as long as they can enforce it, and yet they have the courtesy of allowing you to keep your dagger. And of course, they have no idea what Javik is capable of should it come to a scuffle. Not that you expect such a thing, but with Narbo, no one ever knows. Though you've told your crew about him, you go away back, and the entrepreneur is capricious and manipulative man with whom you did not part on the best of terms last time. Do you remember that? Surely he does. Could he be persuaded to take your proposal? Who knows? Now let's go ahead and make our way over to Narbo. The entrepreneur looks up from a stack of papers in front of him and rubs his eyes. Narbo is a corpulent man with a bushy dark beard and a few missing teeth. Part of his face is covered in scars similar to those left by old Burns. That, coupled with the withered and mutated left arm that hangs limp at his side, is a clear indication of the taint. 
The merchant wears a leather jerkin studded with small bronze and bone coins, a sign of wealth and boldness. His bodyguard, a lean man with tribal tattoos and an outfit made of leather strips, moves his hand calmly to a spear that leans against the wall. Narbo's mouth falls open as the spark of recognition flares up in his eyes. No wonder, it's been ten years. The fuck, mate, he blinks. I thought you croaked. People, uh... Narbo waves his good hand around and looks at his bodyguard. Told tales of your demise. He finishes his sentence for him as the merchant nods vehemently. The business with the uh, Kernak house in the storm, Narbo adds. You tell him that you were indeed at Kernak and the terrible arcane storm struck. You describe the horrors of the night briefly and how many of your original comitatus died there. Old friends. Old traveling companions, but you walked away unscathed years ago now. Sheesh. That fucker Irafons looked after you something fierce, huh? Narbo chuckles heartily, but I'm sure you haven't come to reminisce about old times, eh? His predatory smile makes you cautious even though he invites you to sit down with a casual wave of a meaty hand. Let's get down to business. To defeat the Huns. You tell Narbo to let bygones be bygones and instead listen to what you have to offer. Yeah, well, you got balls coming in here all business and bold. After a tense moment, his stern expression turns into a toothless smile. I like that. The bodyguard visibly becomes less tense, and Narbo opens his arms wide and bows his head. Let's have it. You outline the proposition. You explain to him how you want to give you a discount on, ship mount of, on a shipment of metal scraps, which you then would struggle into Devon, or smuggle into Devon through contacts you have in the city's underworld. Once sold, the profit of the shipment would be exquisite. You do not name the contact, but divulge enough of her that the plan seems solid. Buyers, you say, are lining up, expecting the shipment soon. He sits in silence, eyes fixed on the table as if listening to some noise from afar and does not cut you off at any time during the proposition. After you're done, he looks up and gives you a smile. Sounds like you've been thinking a long time about it. He shifts in his chair. It's a great plan, except for the part where I give you a discount for asking and not much else. I don't do that. That would make me, uh, an almoner, the bodyguard adds discreetly. The writing is good. They've got a pretty solid command of the English language, I'll give you that. The almoner is not an almoner is not a term you hear very much. Is that a word? Narbo looks up at him when the man turns back to you. Yeah, an almoner, and see I ain't that. I gotta do what I gotta do better than that, and what you got for me. Well, we can remind him that we made a great team and could rekindle it, reveal that you're in a bad spot and it's your last chance. I'm gonna give it a go. After a considerable pause where Narbo scratches his beard and thought he turns to you. Fair enough. We used to run together and I know you're capable. But just to be clear, you do owe me for this and I will collect. The moment you make that deal in Devon, you come back here and we share. I want quarter. No haggling that. You frown when you accept this proposal, but inside you're gleeful. You could not have hoped for a better result. Truthfully, a quarter of the price is not only doable, but would leave you with enough to keep paying for your crew for several jobs. It could be a new start. He instructs you to give him an hour, then look for his people at the market and simply introduce yourself. They'll know what price the metal scraps they should give you by then. I'll expect you to return within two months, give or take. Failing that, you'll be hunted. Have no doubt about it. And you know that I can mobilize half the bounty hunters in the realm. You nod and Narbo motions to his man. You and Javik stand up and make ready to leave. Raver here will take you to the back exit. We don't want to give people the idea that they can come back here to beg for almonds now, do we? All right, let's go. All right, so we will go to... The market, I guess. We go to the market. We can take a look at local prices and goods. We can ask Javik if he remembers the shop with Dwarven Curiosities. Or we can leave the market. Let's do it. The small shop is still there at the end of a serpentine alley, opening from a tucked away square on the south side of the market district. Standing outside of it, you notice how it's in a much worse shape than you remember. Inside the decrepit scrap shack is an equally unkempt young fellow who hails you with a jolly smile. The shop looks empty. A short conversation reveals that he's the son of a man who used to run this place. His father never came back from a forage into the dwarven ruins about a month ago. Unfortunately, I don't have Dad's expertise on dwarves, and neither am I the adventurous sort, so by now I've sold all the remaining stock and I'm closing up. Then I'm off and away from the crap heap for good. Go south, maybe to Dragonlands. You talk a bit about dwarven culture and his father's obsession with their forgotten technological wonders, and you're about to say goodbye when he slaps his forehead. Oh yeah, I do have something here that a Vagris would want. He fishes a small brass compass out of his pocket and hands it to you. It's a masterwork, no doubt, sporting runes and detailed etchings on all sides. He's willing to sell it for a token price. Uh, yeah, why not? Let's get it. So four brass and six lurg. Well, we have nine of whatever that is. You and Javik roam the dingy market, and so we're back out here. We can take a look at local prices if we want. We'll leave it. I guess we gotta visit the Scrap King. Walking up to the great heap in the immense tower is a daunting task. On top of the hill, it's even more difficult to breathe than in the ash-choked city at its feet. A hot wind blows from the south. Every step is slow torture. 
By the time you reach the gates of the tower, your chest is heaving and you keep coughing up soot. Before you rise is the Tower of the Heap King, ruler of the trash pile of a town. The whole structure is cobbled together from scrap with the lower levels covered in metal sheets. A huge bonfire of yellow-white flame burns on top of its level day and night. A beacon for the scavenging teams to follow home. Looking nigh impregnable, the fortress has only one entrance. A small group of guards sneer malevolently as you approach. Better turn back if you have no business here, Vagabond, the ranking gatekeeper says. Alright, well, I guess we'll walk back down the hill. What do they want up here? I can open my journal. Okay. There it is right there. So we can check out our quests, our tasks, all that other kind of stuff. It's a good thing that they like put that there because I didn't even notice the book down on that side. What does it want me to do? Close your journal after checking it? All right, good. There we go. The market pane is now active. Okay, and we can go to the markets here. Got ourselves some scrap. Oh, supplies. Okay, so enough supplies to cover 10 consumption. So we have enough supplies for four days. That's probably not good. We should probably buy more. I'll probably bump that up to like... I don't want to go too crazy with it, but maybe like three stacks. There we go. It'll take us up to eight days. Now we also have scrap metal, which we can buy for one silver if we really wanted to. We can buy coal. I don't know if I really want to, though. I don't know if there's really any reason to do so. What does the compass do? Does it do anything specific? Oh, it gives me max movement. Hell yeah. Okay, I'll take that. And so this is actually the codex right here. Alright, so we found some stuff. Sounds good to me. Does it want me to do anything? 50 scrap metal and supplies. And enough for at least 10 days. Okay. I don't know if I can afford 50 scrap metal. Oh, well, apparently I lost money in the market. I didn't mean to. Apparently I was perusing. Uh, so we need 50 scrap metal. I think we'll have enough money for it. I would assume. I will buy another stack of supplies just to say that I did. So we've got 11 days. It said 10 days. Alright, and so we need to switch to the equipment tab and get the awnings attachment. Alright. Oh, I can't afford it. No. How much does it cost? It costs four. All right, I'm about to unload some supplies here. There we go. We have the awnings attachment. Equipment you own are in a pool and the comitatus illustration. So we get less consumption from workers, I guess. All right. There we go. We now have an awning. So apparently we can switch panes in the settlement and active pane with the comitatus management will be there. You can check out the settlement tabs. When you're done exploring, we can click on the arch icon and leave scrap heap. Well, I'm ready. Like, I'm done with, like, reading and stuff. I'm trying to go to the arch icon and get on out of here. With all your business here concluded, you move on. All right. Let's go. You set out at dawn. Ash is flitting from the sky and the distant mountains rumble ominously in the morning twilight as your comitatus reaches the west gate of the town. Almost immediately, you notice the guardsmen and militia at the gate are working in groups, questioning and inspecting travelers. A robe magistrate of the Heap King appears to coordinate the search effort, picking out people or whole traveling groups for inspection. As your comitatus grows near, it takes only a passing glance from him to praise you and the crew, and he motions to let you through. The comitatus is well on its way, and Scrap Heap is a mere dot on the horizon by the time Javik joins you at the front of the line. Just like I said, you made the right choice with this venture. Talk of how you may have saved us all is spreading like wildfire. Of course, we do have to make it all the way to Devon with the cargo, but it's a good start, don't you think? Yup. I'm sure it'll be fine. It's not like we started with this business yesterday, and with that, you go back to your duties. Alright, so morale is up. That's good. Morale is apparently steady. There were with a full cargo hold and filled with newfound hope. Yet, the road ahead still promised hardships and peril. I traveled with them southwards, expecting to reach more habitable lands beyond the Molten Tongues River of Lava. Yup. Okay. And we can go 12 spaces right now. I suppose we go one at a time because there's going to be events and stuff, right? So we have crew management available now. So we can click on the sheet in the top left corner. Oh, it's a good thing they told me that too. 
So in the crew management, we've got morale, which is the mood of our comitatus. We've got vigor, which is how tired the comitatus is. Okay. And then we've got obedience, which is how satisfied my slaves are. Oh, apparently all these guys are slaves. Oh, no, never mind. Some of them are slaves, I guess. Upkeep is how much you owe your crew. You can pen them at the each of, end of each day or keep collecting debt. Okay. We've got nutrition and passengers and all that kind of stuff. Gotcha. So obedience is submissive, steady, sustained, well-rested. Good. I don't have any money to pay people, so hopefully my upkeep doesn't get too nasty. Uh, here you can see the number of each crew and beast type. Outriders are special because you need a fighter and a mount in order to be able to use them. Okay. There we go. So now we've got outriders. Looks good to me. Hopefully we get in a fight or something and we can loot. That's what I'm hoping for anyways. You've run out of movement points and you will need to camp. Being on the road all day lowers the vigor of your comitatus that you can replenish from camping. You can also camp earlier than running out of MPs, which raises our vigor. All right, so we've got the camp icon from the radial menu. Oh, there it is. Okay, cool. All right, I just had to look at it for a second to see it. Wow, there's a lot to absorb here. Each day you can offer normal or double wages, double payment. You can also choose to pay all your debts to your crew at this time or accrue payments, but the longer you delay, the grumpier they get. Okay. Uh, we are going to have to pay later. So we're on our second day now. Let's see if we can get out on the road and make something happen here. We're invigorated right now, so why push myself super hard? The chart is now active. Okay. There you go. We're almost there. Your chart is your tool in navigating the... How far do we have to go to get to Devon? Oh, Devon's pretty far, man. I don't feel like I took that much extra loot, and yet we're out of money. It's kind of terrifying. It's a little worrying. Uh, mark a Vernum south of you. There it is. All right, so we're marked. So we're going to take a turn right after we get around this lava river right here. Yeah, I'm about to pay later. After a long day's march under the bleak skies and harassed by hot winds, the Comitatus finally settles down in a wide ravine. After taking care of the camp chores and checking on all your comates, you go yourself to your tent and tuck in for the night. There are benefits to sleeping out in the wasteland, and the silence is calming, tranquil even. Only the murmur of distant fire belching mountains and the whisper of the wind. The occasional groans of beasts can be heard, except something's making a noise you don't recognize. There's something wrong. Leaving your tent and passing the sleeping beast, you're just about to call to a guard when you stumble across a large quadrupedal creature with fused bone protrusions. It's munching on supplies scattered across the ground, evidently from a torn open sack lying nearby. The creature is a Jokra, a wasteland scavenger that hunts in packs. Before you can utter a word, it charges you. And out of the shadows, Morwen leaps at it, tackling it aside and cutting its hide with her bone axe in a follow-up swing. You breathe out, realizing how she's probably saved your life. Javik runs up to you just as the creature backs off, letting out a howl. There's more of them, boss. They've snuck in. Yay, we get to fight. Alright, so companion combat is turn-based. We're one of six enemies fighting against one of six companions. You can use skills. We've got rounds. Combat board is two sides, the friendly side left. Okay, let's do it. And the order in which combatants leave their turns is according to the initiative. All right, sounds good. These guys are going to attack first because obviously they're faster than me, right? Yeah, I was going to say he blocked one. His block melee skills can only be used from the front row. They can only target front row enemies. And so if no front enemy blocks it. All right, sounds good. Move Morwen in front of Javik. All right, we'll move Morwen. Go for it. Morwen has been moved. Every single one of them has four combat skills. We can select skills, and so they want me to use Mind Blast on one of the opponents. Mind Blast it is. Done. Morwen's skills include the options to push front row enemies back and pull enemies in. Some skills are more complex, allowing a move and an attack, the type of skills that can be used. So we want to use Kick, I guess. All right, let's send him back to the back row. There it is. Give him that big boot. Feed it to him. So it's got kind of like a Darkest Dungeon combat, I guess. A little bit, anyways. Like a little bit of a turn-based JRPG meets Darkest Dungeon type deal going on. All right, defeat the enemies. We will. Don't worry. I will defeat the hell out of these enemies. These enemies are about to have a terrible day. I'm about to mind blast everybody into submission. It's about to be disgusting. 
You moving there, pal? There we go. I was gonna say, I wasn't sure if he was moving yet. So we've got Mind Blast over here, Mind Damage, Incorporeal, Ranged Attack. We've got Hypnosis, moves the target to where we command it. And then we've got Premonition, which gives us Initiative, Evade, Block, and Accuracy. I'm just gonna keep on Mind Blasting the day away. That sounds like the plan to me. She's gonna take another hit right there, which is unfortunate. I was hoping we would fight like human beings, that way I could earn some money. I need to pay my troops. They made me buy a bunch of stuff in the tutorial that I didn't want. And now I can't afford to feed my people. Maybe we'll sell some stuff when we get back to like the main area, but I don't know. So how much... I thought each one of those was like 1 HP. What does he actually have left? He's got 3 vitality left. What do you have? You've got smite. What does that do? Strafe. Hit 2 adjacent enemies in the same row while moving to the side. Devastating blow. Do that. Do that. No, that, that wasn't devastating. That was one damage. Why are you always lying? At least we didn't get mauled, though, so that's good. I love not being mauled. Javik appears to be the guy out here. We need Javik to be our man. He's taking care of business. I like how we got at the end of combat. Made me happy. The two Jokra lie dead at your feet, and Morwen wipes the foul-smelling blood from her axe blade as a guard arrives and talks to her. You okay, boss? Javik pats you on the shoulder. You nod, turning to Morwen as she approaches you. All hostiles taken care of, she says. They got to some of the food, but we would take their meat and parts to make up for it. Alright. Harvest them and go back to bed. Two ivory, nine supplies, five beast hides. Sounds good to me. Uh, my name is Splattercat. This game is Vogris. You can check it out down below. I'll have a link for you. It's not out quite yet, but they gave me access to it. Uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of dialogue in this episode, and so I pushed this one a little bit longer just to make sure that we saw some combat or something before we ended. But leave a like if you want to see more. I'd be interested in investigating a little bit further on into this game to see if it's really grabbing me for right now. Uh, we got hit with a lot of lore, and we got hit with a lot of text out here at the beginning of the game. And so I'd be interested in seeing how much further we can take this before things get better or worse. Hi, doing? Take care, everybody. And I'll see you all next time.